This is the Ask Foleschini podcast, where the modern economy is discussed from a skeptic's perspective. Mr. Foleschini helps you distinguish what is sustainable in our economy and what isn't. Not everything that glitters is gold, and not all mud is dirty. The podcaster Mr. Foleschini provides no-nonsense advice. He had it all, lost it all, went bankrupt multiple times, and is now attempting to come back from zero with sustainable growth. There are numerous coaches and preachers on the internet that preach about positive thinking and how life is all roses if you just care to see it that way. Well, Mr. Foleschini is definitely not one of them. We recommend you ask Foleschini to keep it real. He discusses the darker side of the current economic reality, the side that's more important for your personal and business finance. His first intention is to help you keep what you already have. Not to be a complete party pooper, Mr. Foleschini will also hint at the earning opportunities in the economy today. In order to please the almighty algorithm, please like, share, and subscribe. And now it's time to start taking notes. The mic goes to the podcaster, the one and only Mr. Foleschini. Welcome to the Ask Foleschini podcast with a guest. I'm proud to present Roderick Cameron from London, UK. Roderick is an international business coach and consultant solving strategy, organizational, and instability problems for scaling fintech, professional service firms, and mid-tier businesses. Roderick builds modern business-to-business businesses top-down and bottom-up. He takes a business to the next level, professionalizing its brand, people, and risk management systems. He knows and understands the issues facing mid-tier scaling businesses and professional service firms owners and how to help them address this. He uses the investor's perspective to guide those conversations. Roderick believes valuable businesses need a narrative that demonstrates a clear grip on the math of the business, especially revenue model, team size, rate of build, piece of internet, uh, sorry, pace of internalization. Married to a well-articulated brand built on a shared values. Roderick, please tell us more about yourself. What is your story? Hello, Peter, and thank you for having me on today. Um, well, I've, my career background is, is quite an interesting mix. So uh, I, I'm legally trained, and so I understand the, the culture and practice of, of law and professional service firms. Mm-hmm. Um, I've worked at Clever Chance and Deutsche Bank elsewhere. Um, I had a a decade in financial comms, um, so helping uh, largely uh, big businesses um, listed or pre-IPO to communicate their message. Um, uh, But also, uh, wherever I've been, I've been involved looking at the inside of businesses. So I understand how to build uh, profitable consulting and other businesses, um, as well as how to deliver critical advice in, in key moments. Um, uh, some really interesting moments in, in, in my history, just working around um, uh, sort of high high risk moments for uh, particularly chief execs. Um, but I've um, I've come out of that world about 15 years ago. I, I moved into the world of, of, of business advisory uh, and really working with a, a group and a methodology that looks as a business as an investor would look at it. So often when we're inside a business, all we think about is more revenue, more revenue, more stuff, more stuff. Um, and that leads us to work uh, in the business a lot. And I know it's a cliche, but working on the business, which if you go arm's length and look at it, well, would an investor buy this business tomorrow? Or would an investor pay more for a share in this business? What's going on there? How do we build that investability? Um, and so that comes back to a lot about the, the maths of business, uh, team sizes, processes, uh, understanding what investors look for in the future, uh, and their appetite for risk. So that's been my, my journey to where I am today. I spend, um, I, have a, I run a portfolio of clients, but the key one for today's purposes is, is talking about Capital Pilot, which is the investability ratings agency for startups. Okay. I really like the idea, the idea of investability rating agency. So uh, for our listeners, that is something like a credit rating uh, for um, public companies. Uh, so the uh, credibility uh, assessment report would be something like a credit rating report uh, for startups companies, whether they, they should help you navigate and make a decision whether you want to invest in this company or um, you want to steer clear of it. Uh, 
Um, absolutely. And, and the model very much is um, the, the likes of, of Equifax and, and those consumer credit agencies. Mm-hmm. Which you go back, they were formed by various merchants having lists of their retailers, which ones were, were good, good for the money, and which ones shouldn't be uh, afforded credit. And that grew up and developed. And now is this these massive global data businesses. We, we see that uh, in the startup market, startup funding, frankly, is broken. Uh, it's very difficult. If you're um, perhaps in the, in the West Coast of the States, we've seen the most successful market for funding because capital has been plentiful. And mm-hmm. once you have access to capital, then you can go on with building your business. You can hire the talent. You can hire the, the technical capability. You can experiment. You can try things out particularly in um, the UK and as a proxy for the European market, we've been much more capital constrained. And so one of the the visions behind the creation of Capital Pilot and Richard Blakeslee, the founder, is how do we attract more capital into this market? Well, we need more transparency. We need more data points and we need more scale. And to do things at scale, we need Um, uh, we need a a ratings agency so that uh, investors, big and small, have an independent understanding of how investable a company is. Uh, So that's been the the reason for for creating a a, a ratings agency. Um, Now, clearly, when you go back and and look at what makes a business investable, um, you then have to go back and, and work out, well, um, how how might we set that up in a way that is highly scalable, um, highly independent, but crucially needs to be bias free? A lot of the uh, the academic work around uh, around forecasting, which is what we're doing, we're forecasting how investable a business is likely to be, how likely is it to a- attract the investment that it seeks. Um, uh, crucially, one of the things that um, people get wrong when they're forecasting, and even in the public company, uh, the listed company environment, analysts get this wrong when they get too attached to their forecasts. They, when um, this ability to step away from those biases and create a, a, a process which has checks and balances to avoid our, um, our own innate um, biases coming through makes for a better, more holistic result. So, okay. uh, so for for this um, report, who should order this report? Should startup order this report before they start looking for funding, or should it be ordered by the potential founder and said, "Please assess my um, target uh, investment." Uh, which one? Uh, which one is, uh, let's say, typical customer of yours or client? Indeed, indeed. And I think obviously we're with the, the ratings model, we'll we'll expand to go very early and 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 potentially look at broadening this out. But today, um, the the best use of the uh, investability rating is for founders ready to embark or in their funding campaign. Typically, um, that's a business that is looking for to raise somewhere between a quarter to half a million sterling euros dollars. Um, up to about um, two, two to three million in in that bracket. Now, sometimes that gets called post seed. <laughs> sometimes that's pre Series A. It's 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 that middle ground, which is often very hard to find investment for. Before that stage, with friends and family, um, or, or you can typically um, raise two hundred fifty thousand. Not necessarily easy, easily, but there are there are places and ways to to get that money together to get going Mm -hmm. and in uh, in the uk we've got some interesting tax wrapper schemes to support that and i I know there's there's some other schemes schemes elsewhere um, to support that so today we're in that that middle block one of the the issues that we know founders um when they go to see investors and this comes back to almost the uh a a niceness bias which is an investor will, will take a pitch take a meeting um look through and say that's a terribly good business uh but just not quite right for me Mm -hmm. and there's no feedback loop so you don't know if if your um your business doesn't really fall within what they like to invest in if there's a hole in it if there's um uh, if if you could give that pitch 100 times and not get investment and therefore you could potentially waste a lot of time 
So our encouragement is to start up banners early in their journey, but when they have um, a, a, a coherent uh, deck uh, and, a, uh, and a reasonable financial model, doesn't need to be um, uh, the, the, the thousand page Goldman Sachs style full, full thing, but at least some sense of their numbers. When they're at that stage, and they, um, then that's the right time to, to, get their, um, to get their rating, ideally before they go out um, and uh, on the road, because the um, the rating itself, and I'll, I'll talk you through how it's constructed. The the, the rating itself will give them a, an overall score, so they have a sense of where they rate. And if you think of gold, silver, bronze, we know if you get if you get a gold score, you are five times more likely to close your round than if you get a, um, a silver or bronze score. So we've got enough data to to show that now. So you'll you'll understand if you're if you're good to trot or whether you need to work on more areas. And then sitting below that main score, we look at uh, four main areas, uh, the market, uh, the opportunity, scalability and executability are our four areas. And we set out in the 24 page report, what an investor looks for in those areas, and then how um, the, the documentation that's been presented, typically the, the deck, the model, and a few um, onboarding questions, uh, how your business stacks up against there. So uh, you get to see that you might be strong in areas one, two, and four, but area three, you need more work for. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the founders that get the most value from us take that information, go back. They don't just tweak their slides. They go back and say, oh, hold on. Fundamentally, have we really understood the size of our market? Fundamentally, have we really expressed our traction effectively? Or fundamentally, not just have we got the right name tags for people on the team, but have we explained how they how they're going to add value to delivering this vision, and and do we have the right people on the team to actually deliver the division, or do we need to do we need to go and recruit more? So, a lot of uh, of almost uh, to provoke almost a bit of strategic thinking about the suitability and readiness to get invested. Okay, I, I have a couple of questions. I saw your uh, report that you've sent me for, for this interview. I'm really uh, interested how you assess the uh, market size and uh, growth. Um, is that a third party data? Uh, how, how do you get the data? Uh, how much, how much um, input data you need from a company that would like assessment from your side? Do you have a questionnaire? How, how, do, you, how do you go about it? Sure. So um, uh, remember, what we're looking to do here is is twofold. One, from the uh, the company's perspective, we want to give them as much value and insight as we can manage. Mm -hmm. So um, to so to do that, and you've alluded to the price point of 150 pounds plus VAT being very reasonably. Well, we've pitched it to be very accessible. We joke mm -hmm. it's about the price of a pair of trainers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so people, to make it accessible. So in order to do that, we've got a relatively highly automated process, mm -hmm. um, uh, but we also need to make sure that we, we're giving individual feedback. So it's a nice blend. So as I said, from the deck, uh, from the, the model and from the, the, the onboarding questionnaire, which takes about 10 minutes to fill out, that is the information that, that's presented to, to us as a business. So what happens behind the curtain once that's unloaded and you, you mm -hmm. put your credit card in is we then have three human assessors that are going through a very structured process to look at the information that's being provided to them. Because remember, the information that's being provided to us is the information that will be provided to an investor anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we are reacting as if we were that VC, as if we were that angel. Um, uh, so we're we're working on the base of the information that's being provided, that that package information. And, and as I've said, we look across the four areas of market, the business opportunities, scalability, and executability. So if I, I turn first to the the, the market, uh, in simple terms, um, we're looking just to uh, ensure that the business understands the size and opportunity ahead of it. Mm -hmm. Is there really a, a, a market there that they can reach? And, and of course, Peter, you'll, you'll get this, which is um, particularly 
around BC investment. And in the UK, we've got a slight fetish around BC investment, when in fact, only 1% of all startups are suitable for VC investment. Mm-hmm. I sat um, uh, with, with a couple of VCs at a, a FinTech Alliance event, and they had that on their slide, which is, don't be upset when we say no. And the reason we say no is, we make, need to make sure that you can be a 100 million revenue business. <laughs> we need to make sure that we can return, have a high potential returning at 10 times on our investment. So if we're going to give you a million, we need you to turn that million of shareholding equity into 10 million of shareholding equity. <laughs> or have a high chance of doing so. Now, that's quite a big ask, and it requires quite a very big market and a very clear understanding that that market is capable of being accessed and monetized. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's our, our, our key bit around why market is one of our four pillars. And that's around the, the target market, the size and growth, um, the sustainability of that market, the market needs, uh, what the sort of competitive landscape is already a busy market, or are you first in? And then really around your the clarity of your um, the, the the problem and solution description to meet that market's need. Okay, I know it's a buzzword, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, do you use any AI, uh, so artificial intelligence, to, to help you access the market? Uh, how how do you how do you uh, compare? Uh, the data that you get online with the data that uh, are inputted by uh, yeah. by the company. So you've you've been reading our product development map. So, <laughs> uh, so today the the places that we use uh, a bit of machine learning and in, in the artificial intelligence sense is clearly we have those those three independent scores mm-hmm. um, and uh, and little verbal comments and feedback because when the report comes out as well as the score. There's little bespoke actual bits of feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you describe your team as this, not that, that'll help. Um, little bits of help through. Now, to manage that information, we use some, some scripts, some algorithms to help shape that and, and, and test that. Uh, as we um, develop our product, um, we started adding in some sustainability information. Mm-hmm. So just in terms of uh, reaching the uh, UN Sustainability Development Goals, where that, that matches in, because... Oh. Conscious, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because investors are under pressure from their investors mm-hmm. to to include that, so it needs to be there. Um, I think the next thing we're starting to look at is how to pull from the outside universe uh, information around market size to see if there's a dissonance between what the company is saying and what the what the um uh, frankly what the internet tells us <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and the other data sources. So. That's a key part of our, our, our product development is to work out what we can pull in to enhance the report, but also what we can pull in to enhance the validity of the rating in terms of uh, does the company understand its market well? Okay, so let's go to the next uh, topic, uh, business opportunity. Um, so one is proof of market approach strategy. I'm really I'm really um, interested how you... How you um, uh, assess that. Well, the, um, I, I, again, the um, if we go all the way back to sitting in the investor's shoes, mm-hmm. so an investor needs to understand not only the big market we've discussed, but the the the, the company really understands how it is going to take advantage of that market. That there is an opportunity to serve them there, mm-hmm. uh, and that it started taking some steps, uh, and that. Uh, as you know, um, we're in the sort of the traction conversation. Everything from um, market research data, nothing better than people paying for your product. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but but anything that's, that's helped inform and shape that um, that market approach and how you're going to target that that market, your your choice of, of, of business model that you're you're fundraising against. Okay, uh, because in the early days when I was an uh, investment banker, uh, we, we all talked about the, the, the traction. Uh, and you, you only have traction mentioned uh, in, in scalability. So uh, w- w- so uh, how do you differ- differentiate between proof of market approach and traction and momentum that is already achieved? Uh, it just... Uh... I... I um... Uh, it's listen. It's it's a it's it's a fair comment uh, because there, there is an over a bit of a Venn diagram here. So 
when we sit for our own sort of intellectual clarity, we look at the, the opportunity, it's how well have they described the opportunity. Okay. The, the um, Which is how will we go to market? How do we shape our investor proposition? It's that area to, to persuade the investor of the validity of their approach mm -hmm. with scalability starts to be more about, and this is, these are the runs on the board we have made. Okay, okay. So uh, one is the theory, how you want to do it. And the second one is what are you have already achieved? Uh, crudely, yes. Crudely, okay, yes. Okay. So maybe oversimplified. That's okay. I think that's helpful, though. <laughs> okay. Uh, let, let's move to the to the last topic. Uh, executability. Sorry. <laughs> uh, completeness and consistency of presentation. Uh, in 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 the early nineties, when I went to school, uh, the business plan was all about consistency. So, have you? Are your numbers in sales matching your numbers in finance and all this? Is is this still the same? It it is still the same uh, because, um, as, as as you know from that world, um, uh, sitting as a founder, it's all about the rewards. How big can we build this? How mm -hmm. how big can this be? How much can we make? How much turnover, profit, EBITDA, all these things. Whereas an investor is very much driven by risk. How much risk attaches to this, and therefore where does it sit in my portfolio? And so anything that that indicates there's a level of risk that comes from carelessness. So if your model says you're going to be at 10 million by year two, and your deck says 40 million, you just know it, it's it, it just not joined up thinking. And it's, mm -hmm. it's those little things that just dent investor confidence uh, that, that the management team is, is, has thought this through and has sought to eliminate or at least identify and quantify the risks that they are asking the investor to come on the journey with them to take. So consistency, is a, that's not changed since the, uh, the early 90s at, at all because it's, uh, it's, it's just jarring. So um, being consistent about uh, what you're doing absolutely matters. Uh, and, and the side effect of that is showing as a management team that masters its brief. We've done the work. We know our numbers. Uh, and every time you ask the question, you'll get a similar answer because whether you come at it from a finance point of view or a, uh, a deployment point of view or a team point of view, we're consistent. We know where we're going. We know what our vision is and what we need to do to achieve it. Okay, so another thing that is um, also uh, intriguing for me is startup experience. Uh, would you say that uh, founders that have uh, worked on m several startups uh, have a larger chance or better chance of getting uh, the investment? Um, and, and, and remember, the test here is our, our rating is a proxy for what an investor would, would think, mm -hmm. <laughs> how an investor would perceive it. So we know that it, um, it's the classic thing. Do you invest in the good team with a bad plan or the bad team with a good plan? Well, you invest in the good team because they can fix the bad plan. So um, startup experience, it does it, it, it de-risks it because if you've been involved in the startup, you know just about everything that can go wrong probably will go wrong. And, and you've just got to suck it up. And it's going to take a bit longer. And you're going to have to be creative and inventive. And you know, you're not going to get world-class people to join you until you're that big bigger so you've got to scramble and hustle now that startup experience for some people they even if they come out of corporate they take to it like a duck to water but for a lot of people coming out of a sort of safer in theory corporate job it's a big culture shock mm -hmm. so startup experience and uh, and also experience in the, the 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 product the market the area going into those things are prized by investors and add to the likelihood of investability because they're, take, they're taking risk away from the potential delivery. Okay. Uh, another thing that also in the last one, to, so that I uh, won't bother you too much with the report, but I'm really uh, intrigued by it. So I, I really like how you structure it. And it's, Thank it's, you. It's uh, for sure a uh, huge advancement on the market. I, I am... I was intrigued that as soon as I read uh, your uh, LinkedIn profile, I was intrigued how, how you do it. And, and when you sent me the report, I was just amazed. It's everything I ever wanted as an investor was there. So <laughs> it's, I said, okay, I need to, to, to talk to Roderick about it. So 
let, let, let's start the, 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 the last uh, thing, the, the credibility of current and planned future team. Um, so is it good to, so some people think that, okay, we're going to develop our team. And in startup, in reality, is that maybe 10% of the team will stay when 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 the, the the company grows because they will just the company will just outgrow them. Yeah. Um, how how do you look at that? Um, should should the team write about the future team? Okay, we're gonna let's say uh, we, we're gonna hire someone from Google or whatever, or should they say okay, we're gonna go in, we're gonna go get the coaches and develop ourselves to the extent that we're gonna be able to. Um, to manage the company well I, um I, I i think there's both a bit of candor required and just a bit of of re remembering to map what the skills of the team current and future need to be to deliver what you're asking the investor to invest in so a, an investor doesn't need if you're putting five hundred thousand into a business that's at an early stage you don't need 10 members of the C-suite each, you know, you don't need a chief data officer and a chief marketing officer and a chief sustainability and a blah, blah, blah. You, you, you know you're not going to have that. It's too heavyweight a team, too mm -hmm. high cost. It just doesn't make sense. So you need to have the people with the right skills to get this thing going now. And also potential awareness, if there is a gap, it may be that a business says, at this stage, um, we need to focus on, generating revenue but in the next phase we're keen to develop our data capabilities and so at that point we will look for somebody with x profile mm -hmm. now that as an investor that's helpful to me which is okay you know what you've got today will do for today and you've got a need for tomorrow that you can't fill today but you have a plan to get there and you've identified that this team on its own can't get you all the way there you're going to need this additional expertise so it's that that sense of a little bit of story of signposting, but also the, a lot of the, the key bit around here is the number of people that will just put a or companies that will put a, a a very bland slide up, maybe four or six faces, and they'll just call them chief executive officer or, and you go mm, and, but it, a little bit of narrative saying uh, you know um, uh, Susan has great expertise in project finance, which she'll use to help us build out our sustainability infrastructure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or um, Jan is uh, um, uh, terrific, at, uh, uh, terrific at sales and has sold a trillion dollars of stuff in his lifetime, and he's going to lead our go-to-market. As an investor going, oh, okay, they've got someone that actually knows about sales to do sales. They've got someone that actually knows about project finance because that's relevant to this, this project. Um, rather than just calling them um you know uh a, a, a chief revenue officer and a chief financial officer a bit mm -hmm. bland just giving those extra little clues that you've thought about again how to de-risk this from the investor is do they know what they're getting into oh gosh yes they've got that, that experience to do it and they've identified they've got a gap in the team perhaps and they're going to go and get that gap filled at the right time then i had to go and do that Okay, now I would uh, like to have your point of view. Uh, how would you distinguish between idea, project, and business? Uh -huh. Because I define idea for, for example, for me, business plan is just idea. It it becomes project when it's founded, and it becomes business when it breaks even. What's your take on it? That's uh, yeah, that's, I, I I like that as a, a categorization. Um, I um, would always go one further, which is, uh, yes, at break even is a key point, but mm -hmm. um, as a sustainable business, I know that if you move away from the startup world, typically at any SME, until it's turning over about 3 million mm -hmm. euros or, 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 or sterling, it, it's, it's very vulnerable because the loss of a key individual or a key client can really knock it sideways. Mm -hmm. So coming across to... Um, uh, to the, the startup scale-up world, until a business is, you know, 30 strong and generating those kind of commensurate revenues, that's that little bubble where I, I guess the uh, the buzzwords are all, well, we proved our MVP and we're in 
pre-scale and uh, we're ready to go series A. That's where all that stuff comes in because suddenly the sustainability is there. Because again, mm -hmm. from an investor perspective, you've eliminated a lot of those key risks, the, the loss of a key customer, the loss of a key member of the team. Um, and so I, I agree. I, idea is, is great, sketch out on paper, the project you're kind of getting going with it. Business is right. It's, it's making money. Sustainable business is one where it's an investable, you know, it's truly investable. Mm -hmm. Now that said, the rise in value goes at different points in the curve. So there's a huge rise in value, I would argue, from, from project to business, um, very steep curve up to mm -hmm. sustainable business. Interestingly, at sustainable business, that curve starts to flatten off now because the risk are, are, are fewer and therefore the reward curve is also flatter. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you, thank you. That's a great insight. Uh, another question, going back to your report, how long does it take uh, from the company entering all the details that you need until uh, you produce the, the report? Uh, we, we look to try and turn around within seven days. Uh -huh, seven days. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, um, and, and often do it quicker. Uh, but part of that is because it is um, it's human assessors, typically uh, quite a range, actually, but, but typically business school students. So mm -hmm. they're fitting this around, around the edge. Uh, it's, it's not some giant sweatshop. <laughs> um, uh, it's all kind of uh, re remote access. So it takes about seven days to turn that round. Mm -hmm. Now, what's quite um, what we were, were then able to do because of that pace of turnaround, um, and we've now done several several thousand of these. Uh, last year, we um, were able to. Um, to ask a, a, an investor to put a fund together. Mm -hmm. um, so the fund was, uh, um, the initial fund was five million pounds. And the, the mandate of the fund was to make a hundred investments of 50,000 pounds. So we mm -hmm. called it a boost fund. And the way that worked was that if a company scored a sufficient level in its rating, so it came for the rating, it paid 150 pounds, it got all the value from that rating, all the feedback and the scores and so on. So that was great. But the fund was able to say, aha, they scored a certain amount. I would then offer, uh, would you, can we invest 50,000 pounds of equity in your next round mm -hmm. at a slight discount? You've got six months to close the round. Now, because of the fast turnaround, that uh, fund was able to allocate capital to 100 businesses within six months. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, um, which made us Europe's highest volume investor of 2022. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's that, great. that fund's that's closed great. and we're looking for more funding. But so, so there is think, added value beyond the report that uh, you can add to anyone who, who uh, goes and uh, it, applies it, for the report with you. It, it, it is. It's, it's part of that mix. We're we're trying very hard to make sure that the founders read a huge value from the report on its own two feet. Mm -hmm. We do, The last thing that we want, because there's so many bad actors around the startup advisory space, and we are absolutely on the side of the founders. We don't want to be seen as come to us and pay us 150 pounds for a lottery ticket to win some funding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful of our positioning. There's huge value in the rating. And, and when we have funds, the, op the opportunity to have those, uh, to have uh, boost funding from those funds should just be seen as an extra bit of value. Okay, great. Uh, is there anything else uh, you would like our listeners to take from this interview? Any quick tips or trade secrets that you can share? Um, well, just before we come on to the quick tips and, and trade things, just the last real point about what our learning has been through this process. Um, and if we look at the, the 100 companies that, that, um, uh, that Boost Fund allocated capital to, when we looked at the analysis, both of that and, the, and those who got ratings to come in uh, into that funnel, we found that 50% had um, a female founder on the team, 20% mm -hmm. were all female founders, 45% were ethnic minority founders, and about 40% were outside London. So there's something about an online process that's designed to be bias free that actually delivers true diversity mm -hmm. and therefore true diversification for the, for the boost fund holders. So there's something interesting we're starting to fix in our startup. Uh, thing. Um, 
in terms of of uh, tips for startup founders everywhere, I think um, as as you move from idea into project, and you you look to, to to start thinking about, I've got something here. I think this might be something into external investors might like to provide me with the capital so that I can grow this more quickly. Then um, then yes, come come get your rating as, and. Um, and some people come back and they learn and they go back two or three times to improve their improve their score and, and get that that feedback. Um, with that feedback, I think there's now a number of resources out there about explaining what should be on a on a on a presentation. It is worthwhile just taking a bit of extra time to make that look good. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, regardless of the rating, we know that most investors are inundated. So um, everything from just make sure it's clean and clear um, and, uh, and spell checked and, and, and accurate. Those little things are little niggles that just get you into the discard pile, even if you're a fantastic mm -hmm. business. Um, I, I think once you're then, um, uh, then it is a question of actually being active. So um, do treat a, 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 an investor fundraising campaign as a campaign. Uh, sadly, it will take quite a lot of your time as a founder. So recognize that how, what can you get off your desk and can the other people on the team take up so that you can free up maybe as much as 50% of your time to go out, to reach out to the market, to talk to people, never leave a, a meeting without getting a, a, an introduction to someone else. <laughs> do, keep a, um, do keep records of, of feedback and work out whether you need to change change your deck. Um, if you're involved in physically pitching your deck, practice, practice, practice. Um, record yourself on Zoom, on your iPhone. We all hate listening to ourselves back, but it is the only way to learn is by, is, is by practice, practice, practice. Um, so, yes, the key is a, a clear deck, a coherent deck, um, a, a model that matches with your, your deck. Uh, again, it doesn't have to be um, investment grade standard, investment banking standard, but it just needs to be clearly thought through uh, of what the key risks are, what the key opportunities are, uh, and you've got a good sense so an investor can understand you've got a good sense of where where the business could be and, and that you can justify those numbers. Um, and then the last piece is just, just to recognize the highs and lows of that. It can be quite a slog um but uh but 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 keep going um what is it 99 knows to get a yes so you've got to get the 99 knows out of the way mm -hmm. <laughs> um uh it, it can be a slog um it can be difficult when people say no particularly because people, everyone's in love with their own business <laughs> um uh but that just is, is the way of the market and uh if you have done the if you've done the work if you've done your research on who your investors are your, and your business is good enough, uh, and the rating will tell you that, then you'll get your money. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you very much for all these insights. Uh, I will include the link to uh, your uh, site in the description so that every listener and uh, the ones that are going to watch this on YouTube uh, can uh, get and apply for the report. And uh, thank you, Roderick, for being my guest tonight. Not at all. Thank you very much, Peter. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me on. Thank you, Mr. Faleschini, for this outstanding podcast. And thank you for listening to the Ask Faleschini podcast until the end. Mr. Faleschini would love to hear your feedback in the comments. And don't forget, if you want to know, ask Faleschini or listen to the Ask Faleschini podcast. In order to please the almighty algorithm, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.